Good morning. As usual, we'll begin our service by making sure that the folks joining us on uh, Zoom are having what they need. So can you guys give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? There you go. Ah, two thumbs. Yay, we got two thumbs. And can you guys all turn around and look at the camera so they know that you know that they are there? Yay. And I'm sure you guys know that it, down in the center of your screen is a CC, which is for closed captions. And you can also find the chat down there and you can put something in the chat that our tech team will do their very best to help you with, but we make no promises. Um, we're so glad we have this tech team and they are been so faithful for so long. I just hope we, we all remember them and how many sacrifices um, John and Jim and others have made. David, too many to mention. And uh, we really, really thank them for being present. There's some more chairs down in here. If people want to sneak down in here. We will make no commotions about it. It is. We're a full house. Isn't that great? And you know, I always think 10 minutes before no one's going to show up. <laughs> before I ring the Tibetan bowl, I was looking in Unitarian's wonderful resource for services called Soul Matters. And I saw what they had. This month is celebrating beauty. And the first thing they listed was the first poem I fell, fell in love with. And I'm sure you'll remember it too. It was, came out in our formative years. If you remember the first person to not capitalize words that we were used to capitalizing, that would be E.E. E. Cummings. And I hoped that it would be sunny this morning and I picked this, but we bring the sun as well. I thank you God for this most amazing day for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky. Now the ears of my ears awake and the eyes of my eyes are opened. Thank you. 
that doesn't bring greenly spirits in here, I don't know what does. Welcome, good morning, members, friends, and visitors of the Unitarian Universalists of the Chester River, where our mission is to inspire, inform, and support all who seek spiritual and personal growth and a more equal and just community. We're glad you're here, both in the room and in the Zoom. We're grateful to again have Dick Durbin bring spring right inside with us. And we're also lucky today to have Matt Mielnik. Is that right? Close enough. Close enough. Yeah. Yeah. Someone whose last name is Towsig. Nobody, nobody gets it. Nobody gets it. Um, Matt relocated from um, here on the Eastern Shore in October to take on the job of executive director at the Mainstay in Rock Hall. He's been a performing arts administrator of various nonprofits in his near form, his former home in upstate New York for over 30 years. And I found this really interesting. He's a licensed occupational therapist, an acoustic guitarist, and the author of two books. So very cool. Um, announcements, I have two along with our offering basket, which is of course in the lobby. And we also remind you that we're continuing this month in our outreach offering for social justice um, for the Ukraine um, uh, Faithify. So if you're disturbed by the headlines, please remember that we are, we are collecting this month on behalf of Ukraine. If you're attending via Zoom, that button on donate is on our website. And if you're visiting for the first time, there's also a guest book in the lobby that we'd love you to sign. From the worship committee, which I'm also on, a little wag of the fingers, please consider leading a summer discussion. There's a sign up sheet in the lobby. And speaking as the worship committee, we take the people that volunteer for our leading discussions, we, they're our favorites <laughs> because it gives us a break. And if you remember, it's very, very low maintenance, not, you don't fuss. Most of our service, we, we truncate and it's basically coming in and having a nice chat and leading a nice chat. So please feel free to talk with Nancy or Annie or me if you're considering leading a discussion during the summer or sign up on the, um, in the lobby. And also here's a hot off the presses announcement and idea. The Public Relations and Outreach Committee invite everyone to celebrate Memorial Day weekend with a bring your own brunch and chair to sit in the shade in our Memorial Garden while we enjoy each other's company after service May 29th, okay? So bring your own brunch and your chair May 29th. Coffee will be provided as usual and details to follow. Now, Matt, if you could help me, sure. and if you could join with me in lighting our chalice. To light this chalice as a symbol of the light within all creation. We light this chalice for truth, and with the search for truth be with us always. We light this chalice for love. I really depend on the Unitarians to give me something really inspiring every week. And this week they gave me two things. So our opening words come from two different people. Um, I do recommend Soul Matters, which I think you can all access. I'll I'll look that up, but it is, it is very helpful for me in, in times where I sometimes struggle with my spirits after I watch the news. Our theme this month for the Unitarians is celebrating beauty. And I found two small passages that ask us to look at beauty in a, maybe a different way than we normally do. And I'd like to read both those passages. One is by L.C. Slack. They didn't tell me a thing else about LC Slack. So here's that person's words. 
I've spent years unlearning internalized fat phobia, biphobia, femphobia, and stigmatizations of mental health issues. And still, some days I wake up and wish I could just be normal. Some days I want a break from being me. And I bet we've all had those days. The stuff we hide as best we can and hope no one notices. The stuff that we were taught were wrong about us that would make people not like us, not love us. We're fat and queer and trans and black and brown. We're people who are chronically ill, who experience mental health problems, who interact with the world in a way that is different from the norm. We are people with bodies and lives that we are supposed to believe are wrong. We are told to hide and disappear and blend in, to kill pieces of ourself off so that someone else may think we're okay. But we are okay. We are better than okay. We are beautiful. We are, as Psalm 139 says, fearfully and wonderfully made. We are stardust and we are each of us a miracle. Continuing on, Tess Baumberger writes, wouldn't it be great if you could take a picture of your soul? Then if your mother wanted to brag about you, she could show the people the picture and say, that's my daughter. Doesn't she have a beautiful soul? All sparkly and many colored and flowing around her. Wouldn't it be great if we walked around surrounded by our souls so they were the first thing that people saw instead of the last things? Then people would judge us by who we really are instead of how we look. Imagine no more racism or ageism or sexism or fatism or shortism or homophobia. Imagine falling in love with who a person is just by looking at them. It would be a kind of cloaking device hiding physical faults and defects and even our perfections. And I'd want it to be mandatory. Then people would work at making their souls more attractive instead of their bodies and faces. Imagine people knowing by your soul that you really need a hug. Imagine people helping each other and their souls changing colors and growing. Join in body and spirit in the hymn number 11 in your gray hymnal. Would you like to play through once? Rise in body and spirit. He's gonna play it through once.
Good morning. First off, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak before this group. Uh, I've been here a number of times now, and it's, uh, it's great to be back here in doing this uh, with you. And it's especially nice that my new buddy, Dick Durham, is here playing, wearing his black shirt, I might add. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. There are no coincidences. So I'd like to open with, uh, oh, I like the, yeah, with two very short readings. And the first by Heather Haying, and I, I don't know who Heather Haying is either. She probably knows the other woman that you quoted. <laughs> Some of us find meaning in creation of building things that have never existed before, be they made of wood, words or pigment or wood. Some of us find meaning in exploration and discovery of finding new places or new ways of looking at known places, of looking so close or so far that we see things that have not been seen before. Some of us find meaning in healing in touch and insight that results in betterment, which allows the person on the receiving end to become more functional. Others in helping in other ways or in elucidating in teaching, for example. Others in communication or interpretation in building teams or leading them. The second very short reading is from Robert Fulgham, Unitarian minister. Uh, from his book, What on Earth Have I Done? Stories, Observations, and Affirmations. Pardon me, but my father says that it, it is a, it's a lie that Americans have everything. You have no sheep, no goats, no trees, no oil, no vines, no wine, not even chickens. What kind of life is that? He says, no wonder you don't sing or dance or recite poetry very often. Now is the time that we share our joys and concerns. And one joy is that you can come up and you don't have to wear your mask, but we do ask you to come up so that everybody can hear you at the microphone, but we're still not to the passing around the microphone stage of this pandemic we still find ourselves in. And I will light a candle for you so that you can simply concentrate on sharing your joy and concern. And I'll share a concern of mine to begin with, which is um, just, again, the heartbreak of a mass shooting and my question, how long will we have to wake up to hear these very, very difficult moments of a violence that you see nowhere else but in this country? That's not joyful, but I do invite you to come up and share your joys and concerns. Well, I have a joy that last weekend, I was not here, that wasn't my joy. <laughs> <laughs> but the joy was that I was able to be with my um, oldest daughter and her family and my oldest granddaughter graduated from Michigan State University. And I don't know where those 21 years went, I'll tell you, but it was very, it was fun to be there and proud to see her heading out into life. She's got a job for the fall and right now she's in Europe and the world is her oyster. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I am so happy to be back here. Um, I, when the, when the pandemic started, um, I stayed home like most of us and the church was closed and uh, wasn't able to come. And then uh, through the pandemic, I met my partner, Ron, or Ron and I actually have known each other since we were four, but we reunited um, and uh, he's from Florida. So then I started becoming a snowbird and going to Florida 
in the winter and coming back here in the spring. And we just got back Wednesday. And I'm just really happy to be here and see all of your faces. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark, and uh, I can't. Uh, so That's fine. I just want to, I'm very happy today that uh, after hearing about someone having uh, test positive, the uh, church is still open this week because I know for the longest time we were closed. And I'm just grateful that it's open. So thanks for letting me share that. <laughs> I just, um, well, I'm grateful for a lot of, a lot of things this morning, um, but I'm looking at, and of course, it's a, this wonderful sanctuary filled with your faces. This is always special. But during the entire pandemic, two years, Reverend Sue and so many others, we had a service every single Sunday, never missing a beat. We were one of the only small churches that did. And so, um, and to see us now together and everyone coming back and supporting us, um, the church is growing and um, this is one of my great joys. And I think we might have a concern from the, oh, sorry, past and curious. This this is a joy. Today, I have the joy of driving to uh, Pennsylvania, up to North Pennsylvania, to see some old friends. And I use that word old in every sense it could be applied. Um, but it reminds me that every moment you have a chance to tell the people you care about, you should do so because you don't know what tomorrow brings. Nina has a concern, I think. Muted. Muted. Hi, we have a joy. This little girl wants to say hi to her grandmother virtually. <laughs> hi, this is August. And we are all home on COVID lockdown, but doing fine. And we are happy to see you all and just have some concerns about family jobs and decision-making that are thrown into light by being home with COVID. <laughs> Put my hand down here. And one last candle for the concerns and the joys that we hold in our hearts.
First, it's, it's a real joy to listen to Dick Durham play the piano and special, special thanks for playing Tenderly earlier. That's one of my all time uplifting and uh, favorite songs. Okay. Uh, most of us don't realize it, but every one of us is at our most basic level, a composite of all of our experiences right up to this very moment. Our sense of being alive, and having a personal identity is on the broadest level bound to the number of cups of coffee we've drank over our entire lifetime, the number of times we brushed our teeth, or maybe stuck your tongue out at somebody when they weren't looking. Of course, these uninspiring experiences are situated among the more memorable events in our life. How many times and who we've held hands with buying a pair of pants that turned out to be your favorite for years, the time you closed your eyes, held your baseball glove up and caught the ball out in left field. As you continue to sort through this inventory, it climbs to truly memorable experiences populated with friends and families, great vacations, oaths that you've taken and perhaps betrayed, that length of time you were convinced you were in love. These experiences are all yours, all right, but constantly shifting in frequency, importance, and emotional reactions. The question that comes up is how we come to identify who we are, both to ourselves and to others. The answer is pretty obvious. From a very early age, we sift through these seemingly count, countless and disparate pieces of our lives and weave them together into a narrative, our personal story. And just like other stories, these personal narratives contain heroes and villains that help us or hold us back. Major events that determine the plot, challenges we've overcome, and suffering we've endured. When we want people to understand us, we share parts of our stories with them, all the while selecting which chapters to quote from. The story that we eventually come to depend on and identify with is not an exhaustive history of everything that has happened. Instead, our stories tend to focus on the most extraordinary events, good and bad, because those are the experiences we need to make sense of and that shape us. And amazingly, without changing the facts, we can still edit, revise, and interpret the stories we tell about ourselves. Like an obsessed author who spends countless hours from day to day rewriting and editing their novel, we make narrative choices and edits until the story we tell feels the most convincing to both ourselves and to other people. Uh, okay. In most cases, and in some fashion, whether we realize it or not, we eventually create a fairly unified whole that allows us to understand our lives as coherent. But at some point, this coherent being with this handcrafted sense of identity must then decide on how to move forward their story. Once you have this quasi-defined sense of self, complete with personal beliefs and values that guide your narrative, what goals should you steer in the direction of? Is there a central theme to your life? Where does their story go from here and what motivates you to get there? What floats your boat? A great many people choose what they consider most, the most obvious response to these questions. Their personal goal is to find happiness. Frequently they equate this with success, such as finding the best job, the perfect partner, the nicest house. But there's something a little out of whack with such seemingly innocent ambition. The, su the suicide rate in America is at a 30 year high, especially among young adults who aim for just those kind of goals. Even though life really has been getting objectively better by pretty much most conceivable standards, at least in America. Still, that path zeroed in on happiness often remain, remains fraught with anxiety and despair. Such people might feel helpless, alone, and empty. It's as though chasing happiness in this way can make you unhappy. Ah, but there may be more to life 
than just happiness. Some people actually satisfy their wants and needs over time, but that seems largely irrelevant to a meaningful life. Happiness involves being focused on the presence, whereas meaningfulness involves thinking more about the past, the present, and the future, and the relationship between them. In addition, happiness can be seen as fleeting, while meaningfulness seems to last longer. Sure, there are times when happiness and meaningfulness seem to go in hand in hand, but there are some striking differences. Meaningfulness is derived from giving to other people. Happiness comes from what they give to you. Meaningful lives can involve stress and challenges, higher levels of worry, which suggests that engaging in challenging or difficult situations that are beyond one's pleasures promotes meaningfulness, but not happiness. Self-expression is important to meaning, but not always happiness. Doing things to express oneself and caring about personal and cultural identity may be linked to a more meaningful life, but not always a happy one. For example, considering oneself to be creative is associated with meaning, but not always with happiness. In preparing this talk, I found studies that concluded that people who pledge and perhaps have found their meaning in life are noted to be more resilient, live longer, and do better with the challenges they face. They are the ones with the path forward and are committed to finding the best in themselves. Typically, while directly pursuing happiness is somewhat self-serving, allegiance to the purpose you've identified in your life is about belonging to and serving something other than oneself. It's about what you give and not what you want. It's usually about using your strengths to serve others, no surprise, and not always in the convenient context of happy circumstances. And as such, it gives one a sense of belonging and this places value on the people you feel connected to and who often value you for what you are doing for and with them such as this group. Such connections also hold at least the possibility of transcendence, those rare moments when you feel connected to a higher reality. This might include moments of religious transcendence or a sense of enlightenment that comes from meditating, but it's also like the sense of being in the zone that music or art can put you in especially as you share it with others. It's kind of like the old days when you would fine tune the dial of your AM radio to get a particularly strong signal for a certain radio station. And as such, your story continues to unfold as you continue to grow, unlike the kind of happiness that stalls once you've met your personal self-serving goals. I guess that a lot of you have saved and maybe displayed on your refrigerator one or more printed texts of what I guess you would call inspirational quotes. Could be a prayer that speaks directly to you or a, a literary passage that somehow pulled you aside and said, hey, I wrote this for you. Uh, I found my favorite years ago and I've reread it at least every month since then. It's from Ray Bradbury's story, Fahrenheit 451. Uh, I think you probably are mostly familiar with this book, movie. It's a futuristic novel uh, in a place where books have been outlawed and small camps of rebels have gathered to protect the books by memorizing them. And here, here's the quote. Everyone must leave something behind when he dies, my grandfather said a child, a book, or a painting, or a house or a garden planted, something your hand has touched some way so your soul has some place to go when you die. And when people look at that tree or flower you planted, you're there. It doesn't matter what you do, as long as you change something from the way it was before you touched it into something that's like you after you take your hands away. Stuff your head with wonder, he said, 
live, live as if you drop dead in 10 seconds, see the world. It's more fantastic than any dream made or paid for in the factories. This better than anything else I've stored away has been my calling for decades and has influenced many of my major life decisions, including this recent crazy move I made at 70 years old to come to the Chesapeake Bay to work in a small performance center. I'm not trying to give happiness a bad name. Meaning and happiness often go hand in hand. Having a meaningful life contributes to being happy and being happy may also contribute to finding life more meaningful. Some people have actually tried the group aspects of happiness and meaningfulness together under the term subjective well-being. But chances are when you feel happy and you take out the meaning part of happiness, it's not really happiness. For centuries, traditional wisdom has been that simply seeking happiness for its own sake doesn't really make you happy in the long run. The search for meaning also has a redemptive quality. People who believe their lives are meaningful tend to tell stories of growth and connection and turnaround. They are more likely to tell stories about their lives that tra transition from unfortunate circumstances to new starts. These stories allow individuals to craft a positive identity and give them a sense of control of their lives. And once you've accepted that you are allowed to edit and reinterpret your story, you may come to realize this sense of control of your life and that meaning can be gleaned even from hardships. And there's a good chance that you'll even find happiness along the way. May it be so. Join us by rising in body and spirit for hymn number 38. I'm going to ask Matt to help me by joining in the words of extinguishing the chalice. And before that, my closing words are, I can't sing well, and we have to do the um, sung benediction by ourselves. So it's go lift it up, Philip. Are, are you with me? Okay. So after, after our extinguishing of the challenge, we'll sing the benediction, and then Dick will have a Post food for us. I got to extinguish the chalice. 
we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. Oh, love, love bless your way. Moonlight's on my guide or journey into peace. And